After the introduction of antibiotics to treat patients with tuberculosis in the middle of the last century, uh, many people believed that it could be eliminated in short time. So we have uh, drugs that can easily uh, treat a susceptible case of tuberculosis, but if the patient cannot you know, uh, ad adhere with the treatment for the six months that are necessary, if uh, there are mistakes in, in prescribing the regimen, choosing the drugs, or the patient is not taking the drugs for different reasons, then mutant strains can uh, be generated. It has been declared by the WHO as an emergency already 20 years ago. Two reasons are responsible. One is the HIV epidemics, which started 30 years ago and uh, created the TB HIV co-infection. And the other is the emergence of complex resistances against drugs. The actual cost is phenomenal. To treat and manage one MDRTB patients cost between 5,000 and 50,000 euro, depending on the country health systems and the specific setting. Taking into account that we estimate more or less 600,000 MDRTB cases globally, you can imagine the total cost of 6 to 8 billion euro annually. The normal TB without resistances it uh, counts about 8,000 euros per case. The direct treatment costs and in MDR-TB patients, on average, 50,000. And on uh, XDR patients, it was estimated at about 170,000 euros. So it's quite a big sum. And MDR-TB means resistance against the two most powerful drugs. That's INH and rifampicin. And XDRTB is MDRTB plus resistance against second line injectables and fluoroquinolones. The main reason for MDRTB is people coming from former Soviet Union countries, India, China and Africa. So we see these patients here in, in, in Germany and also in other countries of Western Europe. So it's, it's a threat. If you look at the whole region, we estimate annually 78,000 new MDRTB patients, but of which only 30,000 are being diagnosed. And of those being diagnosed, only 50% are being cured. So the mortality in, in uh, MDRTB and XDRTB patients is quite high. For example, in MDRTB, the success rate of the treatment is between 50 and 60 percent, and XDRTB is only 40 percent. Among the new TB patients, the percentage with MDRTB increased from 10 to 15 percent, and the percentage among previously treated TB patients with MDRTB increased to 44%. So we are indeed speaking about a time. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, there was a huge disruption of the social services and in fact the failure of the health services to reach out to the TB patients. That coupled with a very irregular distribution of the drug supply created really the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and its spread in many of the former Soviet Union states. We have the so-called downstream determinants of the disease, like incarceration is a huge issue in the former Soviet Union, a breeding ground of TB and MDR-TB. Overcrowding is another big one. And then, of course, a number of concomitant, let's say, events like alcoholism, drug addiction. A case from Eastern Europe, a lady, who was born in Poland. She was a model by profession. Traveled all over Europe after being already treated two times in her own country. It became clear that she was XDR, basically resistant to all drugs, but unfortunately then, then she died at the age of 35 years. I have never seen a patient suffering so much due to TB. It was really devastating situation. And of course, um, this poses also severe problems in terms of infection control because uh, this patient's cough and takes a relatively long time to, to die as well. So uh, TB is a disease uh, 
characterized by by slow process, you know, slow to to initiate and slow even to kill. And of course, during all this time, they are still uh, transmitting infections. So. On the tuberculosis ward, we have quite a number of patients coming from the former Soviet Union with their complex resistances. The patient from Chechnya is, is 42 years old. His uh, diagnosis of tuberculosis was made in 1995. So he came to, uh, to Berlin as an asylum seeker and he hopes to get cured here. But it can be assumed that he had no big resistance patterns in the beginning but that these resistances were created during the several treatments he received, but all inadequate. The, the problem is that he has a resistance against the main drugs. Uh, we have to treat him with second-line drugs. These are not very efficient compared to the first-line drugs, and they have a lot of side effects. If he will be treated appropriately, and, and, and he is cooperating at the moment very good, so he may become closed and uh, maybe even uh, become treated successfully. But it's, it's difficult because he has not so many reserves, pulmonary function reserves, because actually he has only this part of the lung which is working properly. So it's extremely important that we focus on preventing the emergence of the drug-resistant tuberculosis by providing early diagnosis, and prompt and adequate treatment with quality drugs, and particularly to enable the patient to continue the treatment till the end. And that's what we call a patient-centered approach. Well, we're here on the UK's one and only digital mobile x-ray screening unit. This is a service that we've been using since 2005. This service is quite a, gr a good example of an international collaboration because we developed this idea in partnership with the Netherlands. People can walk onto this digital x-ray screening unit and have a chest x-ray that's read there and then on the spot with them and they can be on and off this vehicle in two minutes. We can screen 300 people a day when we're going flat out. We target about 190 different projects around London. Uh, that would be hostels, residential projects for homeless people, day centres, drop-ins, soup kitchens, projects that support people with substance misuse problems, alcohol dependency, uh, crack cocaine, heroin use, and uh, projects that work with people with a prison history. Rates of TB in London are now as high as they were going back to the 80s. And while we thought that TB was coming down um, for most of the last uh, century essentially. Um, since the late 1980s, TB has been increasing in the UK with rates in certain parts of London now exceeding certain parts of Eastern Europe and even some parts of Sub Saharan Africa. We've got three and a half thousand new cases a year, and it's about one in six of those cases have got very complex social problems that are highly likely to complicate their ability to reach treatment services and take what we still ironically call short course treatment. That's six months just for the fully sensitive strain. As far as the emergence of drug resistant strains in the population is concerned, this is a huge challenge for us. A third of the cases that we work with are now drug resistant and over 10% of those have got MDR disease. Uh, at the moment on the books of uh, this service, we've got 55 cases with multi-drug resistant TB and four with XDR TB, extensively drug resistant TB. Through this way. Have you done this before? The problem of multi-drug resistant TB emerged because there were issues around adherence with treatment. Therefore, if we are to tackle the problem and if we are to prevent its further spread, we must ensure that patients are supported to complete their treatment. And here I mean supported by a package of measures which includes the involvement of community players such as the general support groups available in society, but also within the health system using incentives. It might be a simple transport voucher, or it might be appropriate housing for the person, or as is widely used across the world, the use of directly observed therapy. And this is where a patient is observed to take their pills. We know, and this has been shown time and again, 
that it takes only a couple of weeks to decrease the risk of transmission within the community and almost make it negligible. So we really have to provide, like countries as the Netherlands, Norway have been showing very effectively, diagnosis and treatment free of charge to all TB and MDRTB patients, whatever their legal status in the country and whatever their ethnicity. Our priority is TB control. We don't care where you come from or what colour you are. We're not concerned by your ethnicity or origin. We target this intervention at people who we can reach through screening, hostels, day centres, drugs projects, etc. because they are unlikely to recognise the symptoms and present to service under their own steam. It's really important that the immigrant population feel safe to report to health services. If they fear, then they, they, they will not report and the disease will still spread. So the dangerous case of TB is essentially the undetected case. The general practitioner in, in Germany, for example, he is not used to handle TB patients. Maybe he has no, seen no patient at all in his uh, lifetime. But we have to teach them and educate them that if a patient is coughing for a long time and uh, that he is losing weight and has fever, that it may be a tuberculosis. And uh, then he has to transfer the patient to the specialist. We need to improve the content of medical training and the content of postgraduate training for doctors to ensure that people think about TB earlier, to ensure that people know how to then diagnose it, but also to think about drug-resistant TB and diagnose that and treat it. We, we need also to have a recording and reporting system, or a, now we call it monitor and evaluation system, able to measure how the program works. So is the program effective? So to have the notification at the beginning, and at the end there are indicators uh, that um, among them the success rate or failure rate or death rate are the most important, tells us whether the program is effective and if there is any problem, how to try to solve it. And of course, allows also to model for the future epidemics. In TB control, we waste a lot of resources through prolonged unnecessary hospitalization instead of moving the patients out to the communities with proper social and psychological support to finish the treatment. You have to motivate the patient because of his side effects, the, the side effects of his drugs he may stop it. So it's sometimes difficult to persuade the patient to take the drugs because sometimes after a few weeks of treatment he, his symptoms disappear like cough and he is gaining weight again and then he says oh it's not necessary anymore to take the drug. Even if now we have the massive effort against TB and MDRTB, we still have a huge pool of people infected with TB and MDRTB, who will break down to an active disease no matter what we do. So what you really have to do is to scale up early and effective diagnosis through a number of revolutionary molecular techniques which we have. So that has been already a spectacular revolution that we have a simple test that we can use in the first line health facilities to diagnose not only TB, but also the drug susceptibility patterns. And I think that is very hopeful. In Armenia, together with Médecins Sans Frontières, we are scaling up the introduction of new TB drugs to look what is the effect, whether we can shorten the long duration of the TB treatment. So I think there are many signs of hope. TB needs a program to deal with it and needs a sustained funding, a policy. Although it's cost-effective to manage, it needs a plan that should be consistent over time. The WHO Regional Office for Europe, together with its member states and the partners, developed the Consolidated Action Plan to prevent and combat MNXDRTB from 2011 till 2015. The most important cornerstone of the Consolidated Action Plan remains the prevention of the emergence of drug-resistant tuberculosis. It means early diagnosis of the TB and MDRTB patients and prompt and adequate treatment with quality drugs and with the proper case management conditions to look at the social needs and the financial needs of the TB and the MDRTB patients. 
one of the key actions in the consolidated action plan is to target what we call the special populations. For example, TB in children. Every year we estimate about 11,000 children being diagnosed in Europe. 40% of the children in Western Europe are below five years. And we need really to include their families to educate their mothers to get the children through the treatment. Because when children are diagnosed with tuberculosis, this is a very bad sign. It means that there is an active spread of the tuberculosis in the communities. So we have to make the communities aware and ask their help, in fact, also to educate the communities and to get the patients through the whole period of the treatment. There has been a lot of research in the impact of austerity measures on TB globally, um, some of them in European countries. And there is very good evidence to show that TB is one disease where if we de-invest, we are going to get an increase in numbers and we are going to get the sort of problems that led to the creation of multidrug resistant TB. So austerity targeted specifically at TB control is actually bad news for society and bad news for Europe. It's a very fine, uh, thin sheet of ice that separates uh, the population that we work with from the general population. Anybody can become homeless and anyone can get TB. TB knows no borders. With the increased trade, globalization, traveling, the countries have to forge efforts, in fact, to tackle this as a regional and a global issue. We can see the emergence of these strains. We've got a window of opportunity to get in there, invest and control TB by simply finding the cases early and ensuring that they can be supported to complete what is a very long course of treatment. This uh, will, will be successful if we are really able to work all together and advocate for more political commitment, more funding. We have the technical capacity, but we need the funding and the policy, otherwise we will never succeed. The description of, a t of TB as a ticking time bomb is apt, but time bombs can be diffused if we act now and we act appropriately.